الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا For the hastening the return of our Imam, please recite the salawat. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل I'd like to congratulate the brothers and sisters on this very happy and auspicious occasion of the birth of our beloved Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, Jalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. We hope and pray that wherever he is, his heart is pleased with us. We hope and pray that we will see the day of his arrival, inshaAllah. One of the interesting things as we will have, inshallah, tonight. Inshallah, we'll be going through some of these. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjir. Inshallah, we're going to go through the a'mal. There's many du'as, interesting du'as that are mentioned, I personally am not uh, too interested in going through all of them. I don't like this uh, practice of just spending hours reading through all of the a'mal. Inshallah, whatever amount that our heart can be put into it, and we can recite it paying attention without being tired, inshallah, we'll try to do. But one of the interesting a'mal of tonight, tonight is the milad or the anniversary of the birth of the imam of our time. What are the places that are associated with our imam? Usually there's two main masjids that are mentioned to be associated with the imam of our time. There's one in Najaf and one in Qom. The one in Najaf is referred to, which is actually on the outskirts of Kufa, not part of Najaf itself. It's referred to as Masjid al-Sahla, a very important masjid. It has a long history. Kufa generally, that city, has a very, very long history. There's uh, indication that our previous prophets, including Prophet Nuh, even Prophet Adam, Prophet Nuh and Prophet Adam are buried right Beside Amir al-Mu'min sallallahu alayhi wa has a long history. When you go to Masjid al-Kufa, if you've ever been, there are certain areas that they would say, this is where, for instance, it is said that this is where the Ark was, for instance, of Prophet Nuh. Masjid al-Sahla has certain maqamat. There's a place, there's a corner of it that they say this is the house of, or used to be the house of Prophet Ibrahim. This is where he used to worship certain other prophets, and then our imams. And then there's a section where it is referred to as Maqam Sahib al-Zaman. This masjid is one that whoever wants to have a connection with the imam of our time, it's been the custom to go to this masjid. The ulama made it a point to make sure that they go there. One of the ulama says, 
that I received instructions from my teacher to go to Masjid al-Sahla every week, one night, and I was supposed to engage in worship at the beginning part of the night, and then have a very small dinner, I'm not sure if we can refer to it as dinner, it's just plain dry bread, to eat a little something, to have something in the stomach, so you don't feel too hungry, you can worship, sleep, wake up in the middle of the night, and there were a list of worships. And when he woke up one time that he was there, he started hearing the munajat, the whispers of one of the other urafa in the dark. He couldn't make out who it was, but he was speaking to the imam of the time. He was speaking to Baqiyatullah, salamullah alayhi, referring to him that, oh imam, we really need your help. And in a poetic language, he was reciting poetry referring to the imam. So anyhow, this is what the uh, Urafa used to do, Masjid al-Sahla in Najaf, and Masjid Jamkaran, which is on the outskirts of Qom, which, alhamdulillah, has been developed after the revolution, more recently it's been developed even more, and it's constantly being developed. These are two masjids that uh, we associate with the Imam of our time, Similar that when the time of the birth of Imam al-Ridha, for example, arrives, what we would try to do is we would go and visit Mashhad al-Ridha. We would go to Mashhad to try to visit the grave of Imam al-Ridha, right? So if there's any place that we would think we want to go and visit on the anniversary of the birth of Imam al-Hujjah, Jalallahu ta'ala, Faraj al-Sharif, the only two places that are there are Masjid Sahra and Masjid Jamkaran. But we don't have any recommendation to go there. Instead, the recommendation that we have is to go and visit Sayyidu Shuhada, Imam al Hussein. That's the recommendation that we have. In fact, that's one of the occasions of the year that Karbala is flooded with people. One of the most, probably after Arba'in, I think the most crowded it gets is 15th of Sha'ban. A huge congregation of believers. Why? Because of all the emphasis to go and visit Imam al Hussein. It's the anniversary of the birth of Imam, Imam al Asr, Imam of our time, but we're supposed to go and visit Imam al Hussein. There's a connection between these two Imams. There's a reason why we're supposed to go and visit Imam al Hussein. A couple of other indications about this connection and relationship. Two, one, in Dua Al-Nudba, which hopefully at least once in a while we get to recite and we try to make a connection with the Imam of our time through this Dua, we call upon our Imam, our living Imam, with different titles. One of them is the following, we say, أَيْنَ الطَّالِبُ بِدَمِ الْمَقْتُولِ بِكَرْبَلَى Where is the one that is going to take revenge of the blood of the one that was slaughtered in Karbala. And we are told when the Imam of the time comes, the slogan will be, Ya Lathawratil Hussein. There's a connection between the movement of the Imam of our time and what Sayyid al-Shuhada did in Karbala. And we want to understand what that relationship is to inshallah take some practical lessons from this. In order to understand this relationship, I'd like to go over a very important discussion in regards to understanding the Imams. I'll raise a question. I'm sure you've heard of this. We reason with those who don't believe in the concept of Imam, eh? after the Holy Prophet, we say that how could God leave the people without a guide? Without guidance. Alright? We say that there needs to be someone that leads people. Well, after we do all of that, we explain all of it, then the question that is raised, okay, if all of that is true, then where is the leader today? What happened? Why is the occultation acceptable? How is that going to fit into the whole concept of imamah and the need to have a guide amongst people? What's the use of a leader 
That's not amongst people. What's the use of an imam if you're supposed to have one? Then where is he? If the, your, your reasoning is sound, if your argument is sound, then you should have an imam. And don't tell me you have this imam that's somewhere where you don't know because it defeats the purpose. All right? And the answer that is given is to try to understand the purpose of imam. What are the responsibilities of an imam? They say that there are three main responsibilities that an imam has. The first responsibility is to propagate the message that was delivered by the Holy Prophet. The message of Islam, the Holy Quran is obviously provided, people have access to that. That was given to everyone, it was written down, we have that available. However, the teachings of the Holy Prophet are not all in the Holy Quran. These teachings are found in his tradition. There are things that many of which are not explained. We cited Salah Wa please. Many of them were not explained during the time of the Holy Prophet to the people. This is a fact. This is the reason, one of the reasons why the practices between the different schools of thought varies. It's partially because all the instructions were not provided for the people. For instance, the concept of khums was not something that was given to people at the time of the Holy Prophet, except for the one that applies to war booty. And there's plenty of other examples as well. So providing the instructions, providing guidance in the form of instructions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for people. The second responsibility is the responsibility that's similar but a little different. They say guidance is of two types. There's a form of guidance that's referred to as ira'atul tariq. All right. A simple example, if someone asks you, for directions to go to a certain place. There's two ways you can guide them. One is you give them the address and they put it in their navigation system or on their phone or whatever. And it pops up over there how to get there. All right? It just gives you a manual of how to get there. Whether you follow it, whether you mix up somewhere, all right? you may be following the path, you miss the ex exit for example, that the person doesn't have anything to do with that. They just provide you with instructions. This is how you can get there. All right? But there's another way you can provide that guidance, and that is you tell the person, sit in my car, I'll take you there. You make sure they arrive at the destination. Okay? You take their hand and you take them there, and they arrive at the destination. This is called al-isar ila al to make sure the person actually arrives there. This is another form of guidance. This form of guidance doesn't necessarily need and require the presence of the ma'asum. It comes in different ways. Sometimes the person may not even be aware that they are being guided by the imam. That's an interesting topic if you'd like to Read up on it in Tafsir al Mizan. Allama Tabatabai, and Allah bless his soul, he covers this in the verse where, it's, he's, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'immatan yahduna bi amrina. He has an interesting explanation of how this spiritual form of guidance is provided for people. It's not words anymore, it's a different form of guidance. And sometimes the presence is there. One of the trends of the Urafa that we have during the time of the major occultation was the one that was started by Sayyid Ali Aghayr Shushtari he is known as in Najaf, a contemporary of Shaykh Al-Ansari and this man, a very pious man, after reaching whatever he could with the normal instructions that he had in the Holy Quran and in the Ahadith he was able to move 
above and beyond that, he required further explanation. The Imam of our time provided that to one of his close companions who is known as Judah. So the Imam of our time doesn't need to be present to provide that form of guidance. That form of guidance is being provided by the Imam of our time. If we prepare our souls for something beyond what Qur'an and Hadith and our normal and regular understanding of Qur'an and Hadith and referring to teachers, what that is going to get, up, get us up to, if we're able to reach and arrive at that station, the Imam of our time is going to make sure we get to the final destination. That's the second responsibility. The third responsibility is a responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that it will happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billah minash shaitan ar-rajim, huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq li yudhhirahu ala al-deen kullih wa law kariha al-mushrikun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent this religion with the Holy Prophet so that it dominates the earth even if those who disbelieve in it do not like that. All right. The governance of divine law, divine instructions, divine guidance for all people, that system of justice has got to take over the entire globe This movement was initiated by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When there is support, the Prophet, the Imam is supposed to take on that responsibility. As soon as the Holy Prophet came to Medina, where he had enough followers, they formed an effective if we consider all the different tribes there, it seems like, I won't see, say this with confidence, it seems like it was still not a majority in Medina. If you consider the tribes that lived outside of it, the Jewish tribes, and the people in Medina, it doesn't seem like the ones who followed the Holy Prophet at, or upon his coming to Medina were a majority but they were an effective minority. As soon as the Holy Prophet had that, he formed a government. He started forming treaties with Bani Israel, with the Jewish tribes outside of Medina. He started forming an army. He formed a government. And this government strengthened, expanded, and took over most of the Arabian Peninsula during the time of the Holy Prophet or much of it, if not most of it. And this movement was supposed to continue on, but unfortunately it didn't. Amir al-Mu'mineen was supposed to continue that. He was not given the opportunity. Why? Because he didn't have the support of the people. He could have miraculously taken control. He could have taken to the sword and caused some form of division between the companions of the Holy Prophet, but the support of the people was not there. He didn't continue with that. 25 years later, he received the support. He tried for five years. It failed because, again, the support of the people was not there. Imam al mujtaba a very, very sad story. I don't know how much of his history we have studied. Imam Hassan is one of the most oppressed of the Mahsumi. A very, very sad story of how he was treated, what was said about him by the followers of Amir al-Mu'mini, by some of those who we would refer to as Shia, the type of words and comments that were made by him, by them. A very sad story. Six months in total was what he had which was filled with divisions, disputes between his followers. And after that, for the rest of his life, he did not have a control and authority over the society. The last attempt that was made in order to gain control 
and to move in that direction was the attempt made by Imam al Hussein where he went to Karbala and he fought he was attempting to take on that responsibility again but his intention was that if that is not made possible at the very least he had to leave this impression in history that this form of government which is considered Islamic by some he opposed it and he made it clear that this is not legitimate this is not what Islam intends that movement that Sayyid al-Shuhada had to spread justice the treatment that he received by the Ummah of the Holy Prophet is something that we are supposed to remember because that is what the Imam of our time is going to establish. We've got to remember that. The Imam of our time is... Well, the previous Imams actually have fulfilled the first responsibility. We have all of the Ahadith with the work of the Ahlul Bayt. That's why the previous Imams didn't go into occultation. You may ask, why didn't the previous Imams, they were all killed, right? They were all assassinated. Why didn't the previous Imams go into occultation? Because that message was not spread. People would have been lost without that guidance. They spent their years with all the difficulties, being imprisoned, being insulted, being tortured sometimes, and being poisoned in order to make sure we receive the guidance, the practical instructions, the conceptual instructions about our understanding of Tawheed, the collections of our Ahadith, we're really doing injustice to ourselves if we're not referring to them. Amazing, amazing Ahadith. I would have to spend years trying to prepare our minds to be able to understand it. We have hadith that some of the surahs of the Holy Qur'an have been revealed for the people at the end of time. It's difficult. People have to prepare their minds, their uqood, their intellects, so they can understand this. The hadith that we have in regards to tawheed, we have no clue what tawheed means without referring to these hadith. We don't know who the Imams are. They provided all of that information to us. It took them that many years, 250 plus years, to provide this, these instructions for us. The second responsibility the Imam of the time is fulfilling, what remains and what he is kept for, and we refer to him as Baqiyatullah, is for the last responsibility in order to establish a global government of justice. Now the important thing is this, we're supposed to remember Imam al Hussein. Why? The reason is the establishment of this government. There's two parts to that. In order to have a just government, we have two important factors that are involved with that. One is the requirement of having a just, knowledgeable leader, the Imam. That's always been there. The Holy Prophet was there, Amir al-Mu'mineen was there, Imam al-Mujtaba was there, the rest of the Imams, they all had that, that quality. But the second part of that is the people being ready, being able to maintain that government, being able to follow through with that guidance. That's where we failed. That's why this has not happened. Because the people have not been prepared to receive this form of guidance. They have not been ready to support this form of government. We've got to remember Imam al Hussein, to remember what happened there, what the people did to the Imam, to strengthen ourselves. Ourse Recite a salawat, please. Allah. To try to 
see what we can do to ourselves to become some of those that are going to support the movement of the Imam of our time. This is serious. There's a story. Is a one of the ulama in Isfahan. We've had many of them. But it used to be, or Isfahan used to be at the time of the Safavids, that was the center of Islamic knowledge. Many ulama were there. They brought in some of the ulama from Jabal Amal, Lebanon of today. And many ulama were already there. So they gathered over there. It was a center of knowledge. And that continued. We still have a very strong hawza there. One of the ulama, maybe over the past 100, 150 years, I don't know exactly when he lived. There are many of them. And the good thing was that they used to be with the people. They used to lead congregational prayers in a masjid. They used to have that relationship with the people, which is necessary. The ulama had that in Iran from that time onwards. Some of the ulama, for example, Sayyid Ni'matullah Jazari, he established himself in the southern or southwestern province of Iran. He had a lot of a good, he developed a good relationship with the people. Now this alim, this scholar, going to the masjid, one night he gave a lecture, gave a talk to the people. He said to them, people, you all pray every day and you ask, Oh Allah, hasten the return of our Imam. I pray, I say, Oh Allah, delay the coming of our Imam. Because I'm not ready. I'm afraid. If the Imam of our time shows up today, am I going to be one of those that joined Imam al Hussein, Or am I going to be one of those that's going to say, not right now. I'm not ready for it. I've got work to do. I've got a family to take care of. I've got this. I've got that. I'm afraid of that. He gave his talk and he came down from the pulpit. He went home. The caretaker of the masjid came knocking at the door. He opened the door. He saw it was the caretaker of the masjid. He said, here's your sajada. We don't want you to come to the masjid anymore. Why? You're asking for God not to send the imam of our time. What type of a scholar are you? Okay. If you don't want me, I won't, I won't come. He slept. He woke up for the night prayers. And when he was preparing for the night prayer, there was another knock at his door. It was the same caretaker. He said, Hoja as we say in Farsi, we'd like to come to the masjid. So wait a second, what happened? You just told me previous night, I don't want you to come to the masjid anymore. Now you're saying, what's, what's happening? He said, well, I saw your point. I saw a dream that showed me the point that you were trying to make. And the dream, the Imam of our time sent his messenger to me. And he said that the Imam of our time has sent me Here's some money. He has asked you to marry the daughter of this very influential figure, probably a businessman or something, in Isfahan. Wealthy family, religious, beautiful, everything is good. Here's some money. You get married to her. Great. I was like, oh, alhamdulillah, I'm a follower of the Imam. You want to listen to him. So I went in my dream. I went to the family and said, this is what's happened. They said, okay, we prepared everything, marriage. The night after the marriage, I slept in the middle of the night. The same man who had brought me the money with the instructions came to the door and knocked and said, tomorrow morning your imam is going to be starting his movement. <coughs> he wants you to come. Did I told them at least one day, one week, just got married. I realized. Ask for the honeymoon. Yeah, no honeymoon yet. <laughs> at least one night. 
This is the issue. Are the people ready to support and continuous support? In order to do that, we have one major obstacle in ourselves and externally. The obstacle internally, which is the most important one, is not being able to control that savage nafs. That's the problem. That's a serious problem. Let me analyze it and then I'll give you an example. Look, the Imam of our time is going to be setting up a government based on justice. It was the justice of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi that people could not take. Remember that. Alright, why? Because when the nafs is not trained to work within the limits and the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set, we don't have that justice internally. We want to transgress. We cross over these limitations, these red lines that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put. We consider ourselves, we give ourselves the liberty and the right. We are working for money. We want to have a large house, a good car, this, that, the other. If it means that sometimes I'm going to have to do it in the wrong way, it's okay. And believe me, it happens on a daily basis. Simple examples, cutting in line. I don't know about here, I don't have too many lines been in Iran. <laughs> you have a line, you have plenty of people cutting in line to try to get their work done first. And lying in order to do that. Bribing in order to do and get what they want done. <coughs> if Islam has said interest is haram, like okay, yeah, but I need I need it for this. God knew you could have used this in order to gain more wealth. And he said no. That's not allowed. If I haven't learned, if I haven't controlled my nafs, the nafs wants to transgress, go beyond those limitations. The imam is not going to allow that. I'm not going to be supporting something. Even if in theory I say, oh, I like the imam, I want to support him. No. It's not going to happen. Especially since this is going to be a continuous process. Usually people have been able to work to a certain extent. The government of the Holy Prophet was established by who? The companions of the Holy Prophet. They gave their lives. They gave everything they had to support the government of the Holy Prophet. Didn't they? That's how it happened. They provided that support for the Holy Prophet. For ten years in Medina, but that took a toll on them. They got tired of that. Working just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not having control over others. Not having control over the wealth. Once the Holy Prophet passed away, that was it. They didn't support it any longer. Some of those who supported Amir al muminin after the Holy Prophet, one of those few individuals who tried supporting Amir al muminin was Zubayr. Amir al muminin used to go to the doors of the Ansar, the people in Medina, and he spoke to them about Ghadir and reminded them, what happened? You guys pledged allegiance in Ghadir. What's going on? Why aren't you supporting? They said, yes, we will. He said, I want you in the morning. Come, have them shaved in your heads. Bring your swords, dress a certain way. I want you to come. They would say, okay, we'll come. Zubayr was one of the strong supporters of Amir. 
They say, Zubair, when they came to the house of Amir al muminin to take him to pledge allegiance, Zubair was there with his, with his sword, and he didn't want to allow it. He tripped, the sword fell out of his hand, and that's how they were able to take Amir al muminin He was a strong supporter. During the time of the second Khalifa, strong supporter, second Khalifa passed away. They had the Shura. Out of the six people, Amir al Mu'minin, Talha, and Zubayr supported Amir al Mu'minin. The other three supported the third Khalifa, Uthman. Talha and Zubayr were still with Amir al Mu'minin. A very upset why he didn't become the Khalifa. But that wasn't the end of it. Things changed. The first ones to stand up against Amir al Mu'minin when finally Khilafah was given to Amir al Mu'minin were Talha and Zubayr. It doesn't stop. The beginning of it may sound well. We're going to join the Imam. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Especially when we are young. But then gradually, the glamour of the dunya is going to start taking control of our nafs. We've got to develop that nafs. We've got to develop ourselves. One person, if we develop that one person, we've added one more supporter to the Imam of our time. We've made his coming that much closer. And the external factor that's very important is that this movement has, is going to be amongst the masses. Government is not something that one or two individuals are going to do. Even if I'm able to control this nafs, that's good, but not sufficient. We've got to be able to have an effect, an influence on the society around us. We've got to be able to build the support for the Imam of our time. There were some good companions that Amir al-Mu'mineen had after his government was established. The dua that inshallah after the prayer we're going to be reciting together, one of the a'mal of tonight, is known by the name of this companion, Kumail ibn Ziyad al nakhai Refer to the dua as dua al-Kumail. Because the Imam taught very good companion, very pious, very good controlling of the nafs, but he wasn't able to influence society around him. Amir al put him and gave him a position. He was not able to deliver. Amir al had to remove him. Got to be able to have an influence on the society around us because the society has got to support the Imam of our time, not one individual alone. It's a social movement. We've got to learn how to do that. We have to be involved with social affairs. We should be practicing this so we can develop the skills when the Imam comes. At least we can gather 10 people for him. At least gather 20 people for him. If I can't do that, what am I, how am I going to support the Imam? I'm here and I'm willing to give my life. The only thing I can do is that. The Imam is looking for people that can have that type of an influence. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, by the right of the Imam of our time, that in the near future, before the end of this year, we see the arrival of our Imam, inshaAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Imam of our time, we'd like to develop ourselves to become the true companions of the Imam, those who will give everything in the way of the Imam, and those who will be able to deliver the responsibilities that he puts on their shoulders, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of and give good health to all of those who help the cause of Islam, especially the maraja and especially and especially the leader. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all of our sins, to forgive our parents, our relatives, all believers, those who are alive and those who passed away of their sins. We ask them to relieve all believers of the hardships and difficulties and pains and to grant them their needs and requirements. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the hajat, the needs, especially the spiritual ones, to all the believers, inshallah. We ask Him to remove 
all people of the world from the oppressions that they're facing, inshallah. Oh, the 
Oh, yeah.